anybody who's never tried a lax salmon fishing, will you hook a fish, one of those fish on a seven weight rod or a nine weight rod, whether it's six pounds or it's 15, it's like sex for your arm. They just jump so much. They're so strong. They, they, they do catapults through the air. Um, I know some people who have a lot of money that can fish for anything they want and they go all over the place, but the thing they love the most, like salmon. That was Colin McEwen telling us why people are so passionate about Atlantic salmon. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Please share this episode with one other person who you think might love learning more about Atlantic Salmon. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to join the Member Society and grab some bonus content. In today's episode, I talk with Colin McEwen, the man behind the popular TV show, The New Fly Fisher. Colin talks about the great resource that is The New Fly Fisher, a sideshow he put together for the History Channel, and where to find 40-pound Atlantic salmon. We get into the riffle hitch, taking a fish on the surface, and a spot to catch uh, up to 10-pound brook trout. Don't miss this one as Colin tells us why Newfoundland is an amazing place to target Atlantic salmon on a budget. This episode is sponsored by Deli Fresh Design, an all-American creator of fine, sustainable fly fishing gear. Stay tuned later in the show to hear how Ross does his part with DLD to reduce waste and impacts as he builds great equipment in a sustainable fashion. You can find fresh equipment designs on Instagram at Deli Fresh Design, and you can get 20% off your next order using the coupon code WFS20 at DeliFreshDesign.com. So, without further ado, here's Colin McEwen, the new fly fisher. How's it going, Colin? I'm great. Thank you, Dave. Good to, good to have you on here. I have been on this little journey here over the last, uh, I think it, I'm over a year and a half now. I haven't, I haven't missed an episode uh, in a week. You know, I haven't missed a week yet, but um, I'm kind of connecting to people through, you know, for, uh, people I talked to. And uh, Tom Rosenbauer was, I think, the person that, uh, you know, recommended I, I connect with you. And, you know, obviously you're a big name out there in fly fishing with all the videos and stuff. Uh, so I, I want to get into some of the new fly fisher stuff. But before we get in uh, there, can you talk about how you first got into fly fishing? Oh, that's easy. Uh, and I'm glad Tom did connect us, Dave. Um, I got into fly fishing because at the time I was in the military. I'd always been a fisherman. I had been on a uh, UN deployment, came back, and I was a little messed up. And some friends of mine said, you know, you really lo- should learn how to fly fish. It's so de-stressing, <laughs> and it's so calming, and that was in 1993, and that's how I got into fly fishing, and then later in the 90s, I suddenly realized as I was trying to learn more, besides books, when it came to video, whether on television or at that time VHS, there wasn't a lot of content out there to help somebody learn, and I thought, boy, somebody should make a TV show about <laughs> that. And that was the genesis of what became the new fly fisher. No kidding. And that was, so the idea started around 93 for the, the new fly fisher? It started. And then, you know, I, I made it a reality in 2000 uh, after I left the military. But yeah, it took a few years. And, you know, it's been 18, 19, this will be our 19th season that we're shooting right now. So, wow. but uh, yeah, it was a long journey and uh, a lot of bumps on the road, obviously uh, in the television world. And then huh. all the changes that have migrated us to being on television and YouTube and all the other places. So, so it's been a big uh, learning curve, but yeah, it, the genesis of it was I wanted to de-stress. I always had enjoyed fishing and some friends in the Navy got me into fly, trying fly fishing. And I got to tell you, the first time I went out in a small stream, and was casting a zug bug and catching little six to eight inch brook trout. I was hooked. Nice. Just totally hooked. Yep. Yep. That's, that's cool. Well, I want to, I want to dig more into the, uh, you know, all the stuff you've done with the video. Um, but you mentioned, so the military now, were you in, uh, is this, you're, you're up in Canada now, but was this the U S or was this the Canadian military? Where, what was that all about? 
That's that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I was in the Royal Canadian Navy, but um, I actually worked a lot with the U.S. and uh, Navy, the United States Navy, as well as the Royal Navy. So I had been uh, posted to Virginia, down in Norfolk, and I, you know, spent a lot of time in the U.K. So I, I did twenty years in the military before I retired and and started doing the fishing show. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, twenty years. And what? I mean, when you. I mean, I know the military is obviously, you know, an amazing thing for a lot of people. What did you, you know, what was the biggest thing you learned or that, that how to, how to help you in your life? Wow. It's a big <laughs> subject. Uh, cause the military is different for everybody. Well, uh, let, let's, for, let's take it to maybe yeah, just but, get to the fly fishing piece. How did it help you to, to do what you do now? It got me to travel to a lot of wonderful places, including Newfoundland. Uh, where I would take shore leave and go and find local rivers to go fish. Wow. There you go. That's a perfect segue. You're, you're good at this. I can, I can tell you, <laughs> you've, you've done this before. That is the, the Newfoundland is the, uh, you know, the topic I definitely want to dig in as well at this show and, and talk about Atlantic salmon. I, you know, right now I'm in a, you know, what we're calling a, you know, a destination season. I'm trying to really hit on some of those places. And I had, uh, somebody in our, in our group that reached out and said, Hey, you should do an episode on Atlantic salmon, you know, or in spe- uh, specifically Newfoundland because he hasn't, hadn't been up there before. And, uh, so this is cool. We're going to serve this, uh, you know, one of our members and I'm sure other people will get some, uh, uh some great value out of it. But, um, so yeah, before we jump into all that, I, I want to stay on the, um, the, the new fly fisher a little bit. So can you explain to somebody who never, I mean, it, it seems crazy, hasn't seen it, but somebody who's never seen or heard of it, what it, what uh, they can expect? Um, so I'll go back to the premise of, of the show and the name. So when I was trying to, when I first started the show, the whole idea was to do two things, profile destinations and couple it with learning and education, because that was the big problem I had. It seemed every TV show that was on, it, whether in the United States or Canada that I was watching on TV, it was it always seemed to be flogging products or very little information. Just here I am on this river in, you know, Conchucka or, or it could be in Labrador catching whatever the species are not great, but there was, you know, they might show you the fly, but they never told you, well, I'm using a riffling hitch and this is how you present the fly and this is how you you know, you have you you raise a and a salmon, and you need to shorten up and do this. There was nothing about technique, and uh, at the same time, on the spin fishing side of the world, the lenders were absolutely crushing, it, in my opinion, with at that time in fishermen, and now they own lenders uh, angling edge. But yeah. what I really loved about that show was the amount of detail they put in every episode that taught you whether it was about the lunar cycle, how tides work, where catfish were at different times of the season and a river. It didn't matter. And I thought somebody needs to take that, put it into a TV show and make it a little bit discovery TV like where you really get into detail. And that is what we started creating in the early 2000s to where we are today, where honestly we, we spend so much time in the field shooting um, things that are related to the subject. So, I'll give an example. We're doing a show about brook trout. We're up in northern Ontario. What people don't realize, yeah, we went there for five days to shoot that show, but we probably spent another 10 days in the field and other locations gathering content to be able to put into that mm-hmm. show. So, by that, wow. I mean shots of nymphs, shots of different types of mayflies on the surface, uh, shooting flies underwater, brook trout holding behind different types of structure, the stuff that really makes people love it. So where we are today with the change of technologies, uh, like I said, we used to be on television. That was our primary thing. Thanks to YouTube, Amazon Prime Video, all these different places. We've got it virtually everywhere. So Hmm. we've got a YouTube channel. um, If you don't mind me, I guess it sounds like I'm plugging it. No, no, no. no, no, For those people who... Is well, it, one of the problems, I know, yeah. we're on public television, we're on 120-odd stations, we're just uh, about to deliver the next season to public television, and, and they're a great broadcaster for us. We've been on, the, on public television for 15 uh, years now, but the problem you get is that every station is independent, and every station plays the show at different times. Oh, yeah. So I remember for the first two or three years, and I was working with the Federation of Fly Fishers a lot, and they would be putting it out to their membership saying, hey, watch the new Fly Fisher and people be 
hey, I live in Pittsburgh. When's your show on? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, it's so hard to track it. So that was one of the problems. Yeah. And we're on the World Fishing Network. We're on the Sportsman's Channel uh, here in Canada. But what we found was YouTube, which we really got serious about two years ago, um, and we created a, a dedicated channel. Um, that has really taken off. In fact, we're getting a million views every two months right now and growing. So I think we're at eight and a half million in two years. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's, um, I know that's not very much compared compared to say, uh, you know, the Katy Perry, uh, right. video, and then fly fishing. but it, it, within the world of, of, of fishing and yeah. within the world of fly fishing, that's really good. And, yeah. and that as the people at orders keep telling me that, you know, We've got a really good growth rate, but I'll tell you the reason we got we have a good growth rate is because most of the content we put in there is either about a destination coupled with information, so it's a full length show, or we put up a lot of educational videos. So I just put one up uh, last Sunday about the basics in nymph fishing, and it's 19 minutes long, and I think it's got 25,000 views. Wow! Which again. Sounds small, but I guarantee you, in a year from now, that'll be over 100,000 views. Hmm. That's the rate we go. But it's got lots of information, and that's what people were yearning for, was how do I do this? How do I do that? Or for Atlantic salmon fishing, how do I do a riffling hitch to swing a fly on the surface instead yeah. of below the surface? You've got that covered. So Little things like that. So if somebody is to go on your channel um, and figure out how to do that, or just the basics of Atlantic salmon fishing, could they find that information right now? They can so we, if you go into the playlist, we have an actual playlist dedicated to Atlantic salmon. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, that's this is the. I mean, that's why this. Yeah, this is like you said. You know, plugging your stuff. I mean, I don't consider it plugging when it's just you're providing you know value and resources for people listening. It sounds like, you know, obviously you got some good stuff. I mean, you know, I could already tell this conversation is starting off. Um, you know, it's going to be good because, you know, as you talk, 10 things come up, 10 questions come up to me because, you know, you've obviously got so much stuff going on. I mean, things like work-life balance, um, you know, is kind of a big one. You mentioned, you know, 10 days out there plus the, the video. How do you how do you balance the um, – I mean, I know that's a struggle for me and a lot of people. How do you balance the traveling? I'm not sure if you have a family and stuff like that, but, but how do you do it all? Um. I quickly discovered, so when I first started the show, I did 13 episodes. When I moved to public television, the first thing they told me, you need to do 26. And the reason why you have to do 26, uh, for anybody that understands broadcasting, uh, I'll explain it. 26 shows, it's kind of like why dramas do 26 shows, because then they can strip it into a time slot and just play it once, then repeat so public television loves that, that they can put it in for 26. And same with the World Fishing Network. Put it in and then repeat. Well, now so, what is the, can you explain it again? What is the 26? How, how does that work? What, what's the Well, we do 26 episodes. Okay. So that's 26 weeks. And then they play that 26 weeks and then they repeat it. Oh, so you get you get two in a year. You get twice the... Th- yeah, we get two two plays in the year. Uh, so WFN's doing that right now with the current season. And I think they come to the end of it in June and then they flip it and they play it again until so, January. That's so amazing because I didn't even realize that when I started my show, I've got, I'm getting on 80 episodes and I started breaking it up into seasons. My first season was pretty much all steelhead and somewhere along the line, just as I got close to 30, it just felt like it was time to break. And I've yep. stuck around that 30 and that was just naturally, it just came to me. And that's, that's funny you say that because now I look at episodes from last year that I did, and they're about the right timing. It's that's pretty funny. So there, there is a rhythm to these things, and I will say uh, to answer your question, I've kind of gone about a roundabout yeah. way. When I went to twenty six, I couldn't do it. I could not do. It. I had a young family, and I was doing other productions uh, at the same time. I couldn't do it all, so I started to bring on other hosts to help me produce the show and and be on camera because. I couldn't be away, and especially with the time. Um, I know there's some fishing shows that go to a place and and spend two days there and call it a day. We don't do that. Our average shoot is five to seven days per episode. So if you do the math on it, that means we research, go in the field, shoot, edit, and upload and output a show every two weeks. Wow. 
and you already know seven days of that two weeks is in the field. Well, that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty awesome. What you mentioned the um, other productions. What what was what, what you had other stuff going on. Well, what happened was uh, here in Canada, uh, we have the Outdoor Life Network, just like in the United States. And I got to know the head of the uh, of the network there, and, and she asked me one day if, if I knew much about the military, because she had heard I was in the military, and she started talking to me about what was working on the network. And at that time, uh, Outdoor Life Network was doing a series called Best Ranger in Fort Benning. And it was getting huge numbers, and she asked me, do you know anything about competitions like that? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, give me a proposal. I started making a series called Truth, Duty, Valor, which was immensely popular in Canada. Mm. And then it was so popular that I ended up making it for the History Channel in the United wow. States called Combat Forces. And uh, I did two seasons of that. Nice. Jeez. So, so that your, I was doing that and doing the fishing show. Huh. So what's your... If you go back to your background in uh, video production, uh, do you have a pretty extensive background? Or is this something you just kind of taught yourself as you went? I took a course when I was in the military at college part-time, and that's all I had. I have no background. I had a lot of learning to do. Probably mm-hmm. the same you've done, Dave, with yep. you know about podcasts oh, yeah. and, I have some videos and the rhythm too. of <laughs> this business and how to do it and what interests people. And so I went through all that pain and I can tell you right now, I'm still learning. I'm yeah. still learning, especially because, you know, when I moved to YouTube, I told you I did it basically two years ago. We've had the channel since 2010, but I wasn't doing it right, and I wasn't putting up the right content. Yeah. And two years ago, somebody who runs a food channel, who's got over a million subscribers, well, he's the daughter of a friend of mine, and she sat me down and said, I'm going to teach you why you need to be here and what, and what you need to do. I was flabbergasted. Yeah. What? I've been wasting my time. So, yeah, there's always a learning curve. That's actually what I like about this business. That's Every time awesome. I think I've got something figured out, there's something new. What but, um, Can you tell me a little more about the, uh, you know, maybe take me to that conversation you had with, with her and talk about, you know, what, what she told you, how, how she helped you to get your YouTube channel at the right place? Well, um, there's there's a lot of aspects of that. So... For all the people out there who have YouTube channels or are thinking about starting YouTube channels, I mean, first thing I would tell you, take the creator, the YouTube Creator Academy course. Um, that was the first thing. Second thing, she told me to make playlists that people would be interested in based on my content. Um, she also told me a very interesting thing about how you have to have a clean look, obviously, for the, the, the homepage, but you need to... Um, realize that with the subscribers it takes time yeah. and the tipping point is hundred thousand subscribers i'm not there yet wow we're at what do you mean fifty six thousand in two tip, years what does tipping point mean well tipping point by that what happens is that a hundred thousand subscribers the algorithm of youtube is such that um and, and i should uh, i'll go i'll tell you something else about this in a second but the algorithm of youtube suddenly realizes that you've got a very large uh, a large base or subscription and you suddenly get put on the suggested list on the right hand column. So there's different ways you can try to get in there, but the more, basically the more, um, subscribers you get, the more people coming to your channel, the more you get recommended by YouTube and it's built in algorithm. Uh, yeah. That's how you succeed. And she told me her channel really took off once she got to 100,000. She and, said it went from 100,000 to 500,000 in a year, <laughs> and she's at 1.7 million right now. So for a lot of people, you know, I mean, you know, myself included, that seems like such a, you know, that that seems like uh, when people talk about billions of dollars or trillions of dollars, you know, it's it's so far out there. I mean, there's a lot of people, and I've heard some people that talked about when they broke a thousand or 2000 or something, you know, you started to pick up some steam, but I mean, what would you say for that, that person that maybe only has 500 subscribers and maybe don't have the, the, you know, what it takes to get to 50, you know, a hundred thousand. I mean, is there, do you do the same sorts of things as, you know, or is there a different strategy? It depends upon what you're trying to do. If you're trying to make it that it's your income, that's, that's a whole different ball game. I mean, there's the illusion that people have that you need to have uh, a lot of high technology equipment to do the videography, et cetera. There, that's not true. There's YouTubers that are using an iPhone yeah, and they have 
a million subscribers. Well, it's about content. And yeah. that's what I like about YouTube. Content yep. is king. Storytelling is king. There's, as we know, there's lots of garbage in YouTube, but there's also a lot of good content. I'm a huge car guy. So if I want to learn about the latest Porsche 911 or I want to know how to fix an old Porsche 911, like a 996 Turbo, and there's a problem, it's all in there. Yeah. And that's what's really cool. So people, what they do is they find a niche that they really love and they develop it. And as long as you go in with the notion that it's going to take you time to build your subscribers, it's going to take you time. And you got to, you know, like I said, that learning curve, and I'm still learning. I'm taking courses. I'm going to be going to the YouTube. Um, hmm. um, yep. uh, they have a big annual meeting oh, yeah. just for creators. Yep. Those types of things. It, it takes a while. So we're two and a half years into it. And she told me it, it took them about two years to kind of get over the hump and get to where they are. Uh, the, the, the channel I'm talking about is called the food geek. Oh, and yeah. the name of the girl is Sarah and it's a great channel and they do all these different short recipes. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about, about the algorithm, I alluded to it before. Um, we're getting away bit from fly fishing, but we're not. <laughs> no, because, that's right. No. And this is, this is important. One of the things that, that why our channel is being found is that uh, a few years ago, it'd be just, about two years ago, YouTube changed their algorithm to recognize and reward content producers who made video that was over 10 minutes. Hmm. The reason they did that, we all remember the days when YouTube was fairly new, the talking dog and all the other things. Well, that was all great. And that's when they were making, like everyone was telling me, oh, if you go on YouTube, make your videos two minutes or less. And I was doing that kind of thing. Yep. But then Facebook came along and absolutely crushed it. And stole all that business away from YouTube. And YouTube was floundering for a bit. And that's when they did a reversal and said, no, we're going to go for long form content. We want producers who make TV shows, who, who want to make long format type of uh, productions that people will engage with for longer. Yeah. And they're also thinking about the revenues of advertising around that. So it was a win-win for everyone. So that's one of the reasons why we're being found more is because I try to make everything. We do make some things that are four to six minutes long, but I, I don't put up the 59 second Instagram videos and it's not that they're not good. It's just, I find the YouTube engagers, whether they're sitting in an airport with their phone or iPad, they want a long form court content with lots of solid information. Yeah. Where in on Facebook, they want the short and sweet. That's right. On Instagram, obviously, you don't have a choice. <laughs> so we focus. We, I mean, we're on Instagram. I'm still learning about that. But really, I'm putting all my energy into YouTube because to me, it's the new broadcaster. Yeah. And the, what I like about it, it's 24-7. I can have somebody in England that can look at something about Atlantic salmon fishing, and they want to go to Newfoundland, and they want to learn about places and things, and what do you need to do. We have all that information in there and more. That's what's cool. I can yeah. build things for people to use a resource. So we've been working with Wyoming. We are shooting four or five shows there this season. We're going to be doing different parts of the state, all focused on trout fishing. And the goal is to have it over the next three seasons that we build like a nice bit of video content about where to go, types of times of year. So we did the last two shows we did there uh, were last fall. We did late season bighorn river fishing. Hmm. And a lot of people didn't realize that, you know, everyone's pretty used to the August, September, go for the hoppers and all that. No, no, we were there in October hmm. and it was snowing and we were catching big brown trout on mice patterns Nice on the surface and the snow was falling around us. So cool. how cool is that? Yeah. And, and there's a, that's what we call a shoulder season. A lot of people don't know about that. Yep. So, yep. and we're going to do the regular stuff. So I guess the thing is what I like about YouTube and like I said, the way they're rewarding us and why we're having such good growth is because we're building long form content with lots of information, lots of engagement, and it seems to be extrapolating. Yeah. Yeah. No, it all makes sense. I just think about my own example and I think it's kind of similar, you know, whatever you're, you know, creating, you know, thinking about your, your listener and, and, you know, what they need is probably the, you know, the best route to go. And who knows, I mean, YouTube might, uh, <laughs> might go back to the the short form, you know, eventually and say, "Hey, we want to." Oh. As that change, I mean, you know, I've I've followed a little bit on the the Google. You know how quick that changes from, 
you know, the algorithms. So I think that's always the, the struggle. You don't want to get involved in that. But yeah, no, I mean, you're obviously providing, I don't know if it's the best content out there, but it seems like, you know, you've got to be one of the bigger ones. I mean, is there any other, are there any other shows out there that are doing something similar to what you're doing now in fly fishing? Well, I don't know if there's shows. I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of Todd Moen and uh, his channel yeah. on YouTube because uh, to me, Todd Moen's a painter. He, he's an artist. He's, he just builds the most beautiful videos about incredible destinations. And, but I'm not doing that. You know, that's a, it's kind of like the film festivals go around, whether it's I have four, I have three. I mean, they've, everything's got its place. And I'm trying to do more, I, 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 the way I tell people, I'm the big E with the little D. So I'm education, but destination too, but I'm putting more of my focus on education. Yeah. Because I find that, that there's a huge group of people, not just people who are learning how to fly fish, but a whole bunch of people like myself, where, and that's why I named the show, by the way, The New Fly Fishers, because every time I think I know something, I go somewhere and I discover, well, what I thought would work here in Wyoming will not work as it did back in upstate New York. Hmm. We're yeah. always learning. And that's, I think that's the appeal of fly fishing and Tom Rosenbauer. And I had a good discussion the one day about it not long ago when I was at uh, his place in Vermont and just about how that's what helps keep him engaged is that, you know, you go to Belize and the tarpon fishing is completely different in Southern Belize as it is compared to Mexico, yeah. Bahamas, et cetera. And are they tarpon that are resident? Or are they migratory? Two different fish and, <laughs> and, and two fish that have different types of pressures on them. So I guess the thing is, that's what we're trying to build into the show, is highlight places people can go, as well as teaching them about what you need to know when you go there, what to bring. There's not always guides. And you always need to think about if you go there on your own. Yeah, I was just going to so, say, do you have, you know, I, I recently had a guest, uh, um, a New York Times columnist, uh, the Frugal Traveler. We're doing a little bit of a, not only a destination season, but I'm trying to mix in DIY stuff where it, where it fits. And, you know, I brought him on because I wanted to, you know, for those people that don't have $8,000, $15,000 for a lodge, you know, how they might do it, do it themselves. And, uh, and he brought on a bunch of good tips, you know, on that show. Um, but, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, it was it was good. But um, you know, as you get into this, do you on your show cover some of those things? Uh, I mean, is that a topic you ever think about? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I've made it a point that every year that we do a number of shows that are what I would call do it yourselves. And I'll give an example: I'm going to Hearst Air this year. Uh, Hearst Air. Some people might know that name. They're famous because they fly people to the Sutton River in northern Ontario, which is renowned for the brook trout it has. Uh, but they also have a bunch of remote outposts, which are basically cabins or small cottages on a lake, sometimes with a river running into it. So I'm going up there with Bill Spicer, one of the other hosts, and we're going into this uh, remote outpost, I think it's called Napkin Lake, and we're going to go fly fish for pike on a fly. And we're going to and it's very inexpensive. Um, we did one last year on brook trout. Uh, we we're doing another. We're doing a brook trout one this year, and we're doing a northern pike one. So yeah, I'm doing a balance. Like, yeah, trust me. I, okay. I you know I, I'm very much appreciate when people give me feedback. I, I get them as emails from the TV show, but I get more from YouTube, which is great. And people will say, "Hey, that's really great. I love that lodge you went to, and name a place." And it, but it's fifteen thousand dollars a week. I can't afford yeah. that. And I go. I appreciate that, but we're doing a balance. There's some people who are looking for that, have that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. are in that snack bracket and can afford it. But I also have the people that are looking for, Hey, I've got $1,500 to spend. What can I do with a friend for a week? Exactly. There are places you can go. Yeah. And we also do drive to places, you know, that are, that's another big one. I'm going on holidays actually this, uh, this coming uh, Saturday and I'm going up to Northern Ontario driving for, I live and it's, I live within an hour of the border in uh, upstate New York, and I'm going up to Northern Ontario, staying at a cabin that charges me $500 Canadian, so that's like 400 US. I'm sharing the cabin with a friend from Michigan, and we're going out for big, giant, pre-spawn smallmouth bass. Hmm. Wow. And that's going to be a very economical trip. We're bringing our own food, and we're going to catch bass to seven pounds. Cool. Are you documenting... 
are you documenting that trip on your on your show? Absolutely not. Yeah, this is all. This is holiday so you time. separate. Just so you made separate. Some photos. Yeah. I do separate it because sometimes, uh, you know, it's like I went to Patagonia this winter. I went to the same place two years ago and did a show and the owner invited me to come back and I paid and I went with some friends because I love the place so much. I got to have my downtime too, where I don't have to be speaking to a camera yeah. and at all our hosts, I, I encourage all of them to do that. And I actually try to get them out on trips because it's important for us to have like when you're, when people would always think, Oh yeah, you're getting to go to these great places and it's not work. It is actually a lot of work because you don't see, I mean, everyone says, Oh yeah, the pressure to catch fish. No, we're doing a lot of other stuff. Mm-hmm. All that content I was talking about, like we're sitting there with the cameraman putting GoPro sevens down in the water and we're getting aerial shots of this. And we're doing, it's a lot of work. And there's a lot of times you that the cameraman's telling you, Hey, don't fish. I need to go do this. Yeah. And you got to sit there. Do because you, guys, you know you're going to make that cast, hook the biggest fish of the day, <laughs> and he won't have the camera on you. Right. Because he's busy focusing on, you know, an eagle in a nest or whatever the, the cutaway may be. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, there's, well, I mean, yeah, like I said earlier, there's a zillion questions that keep coming up to me, and I've, um, we <laughs> we could keep going on this, uh, but I got to switch this over and uh, jump into some, some of the Atlantic Salmon stuff, because I know um, you've, you've covered this, and maybe you can just start off talking about you know, if you're, if somebody's heading up to Newfoundland for Atlantic salmon, maybe you just talk about the whole experience, you know, you're from where you head out, getting up there, what it takes, any tips along the way. And then we can talk a little bit about fishing. Okay. Uh, Dave, before I do that, uh, do you mind if I just talk in general about Atlantic salmon, where they are Oh yeah, and, be awesome. um, just to help people, because I know you probably got a lot of listeners in the West as well as down South and, and they may not have tried Atlantic salmon. Yep. They're kind of like steelhead in BC and Oregon and places like that. They're very distinct species, and they're they're only in certain areas. Kind of like going for redfish in Louisiana are very different than the redfish in in the Carolinas. Hey, right? I, I got a hey, I got a call. I got a, one question for you before you get on that. Um, yeah, is it is it Newfoundland or is it New Newfoundland? Newfoundland. It's just Newfoundland. You pronounce it Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Okay, so I, I got it right. Yeah, so, so just yeah. for a heads up, because I know there's some Oregonians out there that might uh, that might call you out on this. It's uh, it's Oregon. It's Oregon. Oregon. I I love it. It, I, it 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 doesn't matter at all. But it's so funny. No, People I'm glad you. Hey, correct me. <laughs> People literally have written. Uh, there's bumper stickers that are like Oregon. You know, talking about how the the opposite. But yeah, Oregon and. Uh, it's it's one of those funny things, but okay, that's good. I just want to make sure we're totally clear. So it's Newfoundland, and, and I got it straight. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, I've been a fervent Atlantic salmon angler since I got into fly fishing because I I was at the time I was posted to Halifax in Nova Scotia, and after I got into doing the brook trout thing, then my same friend said, "Well, you've got to come up to Cape Breton with us, which is the northern part of Nova Scotia, and try Atlantic salmon." And of course, that really bad thing happened, Dave, which is I went out the first time and I hooked about a 12 pound Atlantic salmon. And wow. Wait, which, is a, up after that. which is a small, uh, kind of a small uh, Atlantic salmon, right? Well, I would say that's a good, it depends where you are, but okay. for that river, it was small. That's Marguerite yeah. River where I was. Because uh, I heard you're somebody. Right, it can be 25 pounds. Okay. Yeah. I was listening to a, a show or somebody talking about how. You know, I'm not sure where they were. Actually, I think they were over in uh, in uh, out of Europe or whatever. But it was, you know, they were saying, you know, if you got something under 20 pounds, you know, people, the guides were like, ah, that's nothing. You know, they're going for like 40 pounders. That that would be Norway. Yeah. Okay. Norway's Norway. got some very large fish, but but that's kind of like the uh, there's some rivers in Quebec and in New Brunswick. The Rusty Goose is one that comes to mind right now, which is a great river, but. Those are places where you're not fishing for numbers, you're fishing for size. Yeah. They don't have a lot of fish, but when they when you hook one, they're 25 or 30 pounders. Yeah, they're wow. big, big fish. And, and, and 12 so pounds is amazing. So that's something important to note here. Yeah. Well, that's an important thing to know is that a lot of rivers have different um, strains of Atlantic salmon. Some are known for, like, numbers of fish, and but they're going to be smaller. They're going to be 6 pounds to 12 pounds. But you're going to get a lot of opportunity where in other places they've got larger fish but less opportunity. Yeah. I, I think for my sense. first trip, 
for my first trip, uh, and I haven't gone for them yet, but I think the uh, the six to twelve pounders, I'd be totally happy with catching more of those, and, and then maybe as I got into it, maybe going for the the trophy stuff. But is that now? If we're talking the, the rivers where we're heading up to Newfoundland, what what do they have up there? They have everything. They have a, a, a multitude of different sizes and uh, different types of fishing. Some are pub- uh, very uh, public access and some are more difficult to get to. It depends part, which part of Newfoundland. Now, very important geography-wise to make the distinction that Newfoundland is the island and to the west of Newfoundland attached to Quebec is Labrador. Labrador and Newfoundland are the same province. Like, I know right. that people who are from Labrador would freak about this, but they are the same government. Huh. But... Labrador, what's the geography? It's, it's almost the size of Alaska, and it has wow. 30,000 people living in it. Jeez, is it that big? That's amazing. Yes, and it's there's Gosh. more bears than there's people wow. in Labrador. So it's a really, it in my mind, and I've been all over uh, North America, and I've been through a lot parts of Alaska, it is the last, it is the last frontier. I know everyone says Alaska, but I'm sorry, I've been up there. There's a lot yeah. of people on those yeah. rivers. You go, you fly into Labrador, you don't see anybody. No kidding. Yeah. And remember, there's two, ta- there's three towns or cities, not even cities, but towns in Labrador, uh, Goose Bay, Labrador City, and Nain in the north. And between them, they've got 20,000, over 20,000 of that 30,000. <laughs> So everyone, if you go out in the wilderness, there's only one road through Labrador, by the way. Yeah. One. You have to fly everywhere. So that's pretty cool. Hmm. That's also why you catch seven, eight, nine, ten pound brook trout there, which is oh. why it's on everyone's bucket list, right? Yeah. But for Atlantic salmon, they have really good Atlantic salmon runs up and down the coast, where in Newfoundland, Newfoundland has a good population. It has, I think it's about 600,000 people that live on the island, but there's lots of rivers lots of different fishing opportunities and it's a very a lot, a much better access hmm. and a very different price point. Um, an important thing uh, that's to right. distinguish. Labrador so, is pretty expensive. But, well, it, it is. And that's why I want to, and it's, be, and it's to be fair to the operators. It's also because they have to pay so much money to fly everything in. And those flo- float planes cost a lot to, right. to haul food, staff, gear, customers. It, it's a, it's expensive to run a lodge out there. Yeah. Um, so just going back to it, we were going to start it. So if you're looking for Atlantic salmon, um, it really starts in New Brunswick. I know they have a little bit in Maine, but not really. So it's New Brunswick. You've got Quebec. You've got a little bit in Prince Edward right. Island, but then you, it really is the, the place to go is Newfoundland Labrador. Yeah. Um, and New Brunswick's got some really good rivers and they got some great lodges. Um, I, know, I love the rest of Goosh and parts of the Miramichi and places like that. And we're hoping to go back and do some more shows, uh, especially on the rest of Goosh. That's, I love that. Tom Rosenbauer loves that river. We sent him to uh, a lodge there, and he it's in our channel. He loved it. He was using a two, uh, two-handed two rod and was swinging flies, and they're big fish, big, big, big fish. But going back to Newfoundland, um, I guess the first thing I should tell you, it's very economical to go to compared to any place else. It, it's, you know, your average price is going to be 3500 and at the top end it would be $4,500 mm-hmm. Canadian <laughs> for a week with okay. a guide. Cool. Now, I should mention right here, you were talking about little bits of information. Uh, it's required by law that unless you're a Newfoundlander, you have to have a guide on a river. Oh, wow. It's required by law. Newfoundland and Labrador. There you go. It that uh, rule dates back. It, it dates back to like the 1940s, huh. when Lee Wolf used to go up there, and they brought in the the, the law for a number of reasons. Uh, my understanding was there was a lot of people. Lee Wolf was one of the biggest proponents of Newfoundland and Labrador. He used to fly around, and if you go look at some of his uh, old shows that he's done, they were all done up there, especially on the west coast of Newfoundland. Um, and wonderful rivers, but people were starting to come up a lot because he was promoting it down in New York. Yeah. And a lot of people in the East loved, you know, uh, Atlantic salmon, much like, you know, on the West, they like steelhead. So people were going up there, but the problem was they were dying because it's, <laughs> they're 
big rivers, the weather can change, a lot of factors. So the government brought in a thing and said that there has to be a guide with somebody and maximum of two people per guide, but you have to have a guide. Hmm. Do you feel like so that's, somebody, that's still that's a good law to have up there still? I, definitely for Labrador. Um, I don't want to wade into the politics of whether it's a good thing in Newfoundland, but I will say this. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm going to Montana or I'm going to Newfoundland. It sure is great to have a guide get you to where the fish are, show you how to fish them properly, and get going. Get into fish right away as opposed to, you know, yeah. uh, possibly being frustrated two days in and not realizing you're fishing improperly or not even fishing to where the fish are holding. Right. Well, these, wait, are, they're, these are big rivers, some of them. And a, a way you might make, I'm not sure, yeah, we don't have to get into all the politics there, but one way you might make it better, I'm just thinking, you know, that, well, again, I don't know the trip, you're going to explain it right now, but um, but maybe you have to get a guide for your first day or week or, you know, a couple of days, and then you can go without once you learn the once you learn the beat and stuff like that, but I'm sure there's, there's good reasons behind it, but, um, okay. So, so you have to have a guide. So if you, if you're heading up there, you have to get into, but you don't necessarily have to go to a lodge. Do people go up there and just get nope. a guide and, and kind of do that route? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, especially on the West coast of Newfoundland, uh, and that's the area from Stephenville all the way up to corner Brook and all the way to St. Anthony's in the very tip. So, uh, yes. In fact, if you, you know, you were to contact the local chamber of commerce in some of these small towns, they'll be able to hook you up with a guide. You stay at a motel, you can fish very economically. Okay. And where would you, is that what you would recommend as far as you're heading up there, you want to get a good guide just to, to go there? Any other tips on finding a good guide? Um, there are blogs and you can go into some of the Facebook pages that people have there and ask, hey, I'm going to say you want to fly into corner brook so that's a uh, they have a, an international airport there and you're flying in there and you say i want to go fishing in and around humber uh, or not humber um the the gross Morn park and i want to do some atlantic salmon fishing they'll help you so okay. there are guides available yeah. uh as well as at the at some of the uh, lodges and there's actually like there's one right near gross Morn park uh it's on the humber river uh, a great lodge and they have guides and they can point out and it's very economical to stay there gotcha okay perfect perfect so so okay so we're moving along we're, we're gonna grab a guide get that lined up get your location lined up anything else to think about as we're preparing the trip and getting ready to you know just just get things lined up well i think the one thing we kind of miss which is um right at the start and it's the same thing for steelhead why atlantic salmon so why wouldn't I go and spend that same money to go to Montana or Wyoming for my next trip? I'm down in Houston, Texas, or I'm in Ohio, and I'm thinking about where I'm going to take my fish trip. Why would I go catch Atlantic salmon? has to do with the way they fight. They mm. call them the silver leaper. They're so strong. They jump so much. They're so much fun. So that's what got me hooked. Um, yeah, brown trout are great. Mm. Rainbow trout are great. Smallmouth bass are great. I love all those. But Atlantic salmon, much like steelhead on the West Coast, yeah. uh, the salt run ones, they're so strong. They jump so hard. They're going to test your capabilities as a, an angler to land them. And even more, you better have the right equipment and, you know, everything from your tippet to the drag on your reel. Yeah. I've seen reels blow up on rivers where <laughs> somebody's hooked into a 15-pound Atlantic salmon that has said, okay, I'm going downtown, and it just screams off, and the reel blows up. Yeah. What, what is the, uh, what's the typical setup? Can you go through the, the rod, reel, line, uh, tippet setup real quick? Maybe may even talk about flies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, it again, uh, I would take a 7 weight, and I would take a 9 weight. Now, and now are you also, are, are, are guys mostly doing a kind of spay, or is this single hand stuff? Uh, it can be both. So, that's again, we're getting some local information. Uh, really help. So if you're going, there's some big rivers in Newfoundland. There's the exploits, there's the Humber, there's the Gander. If you are going to a place where they have boats and the guy takes you out in a boat and they're those long Gander boats, they call them, um, that they, you see people pulling them, like in New, uh, you see them in Quebec, you see them in New Brunswick, and they do the same ones there. They're the long, thin ones, and the, the sport, as they call them, will be in the bow of the boat. It'll be casting out, and the guy will be at the back. Um, 
then you only need a single hand. But on those, but if you're doing it from shore, then yeah. Uh, okay. On those big rivers, you want to have a two-handed rod okay. or at least a switch to get that fly out to some of the places where the sound will be lined. Okay, and are you pretty much, um, is this a, a swing game or guys also doing other techniques to, to get them? No, that's a good question. Um, this is what I love about Atlantic Salmon. Uh, they can be both top water and swinging the fly. It depends upon factors of how, like how long have the, the salmon been in the river? Yeah. When they're really fresh, they're very aggressive. They'll come up readily to a bomber or a dry fly. And that is so much fun to see, you know, an 18 pound Atlantic salmon come up and Jeez. bump your fly and do it three times in a row yep. and then finally eat it. Oh. You agitate it enough. That's, that's, that's crazy. what I love about Atlantic salmon. Then you hook them <laughs> and we've got some great video in slow motion of yeah. these things. What would be a good, if somebody um, wanted to right now, uh, well, not right now. They should listen to the rest of the show. But if they wanted to click over to one of your videos that shows that, do you, do you know one off the top of your head? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you wanted to see some real good, pardon the expression, fish porn uh, <laughs> when it comes to Atlantic salmon, uh, these are both shot in uh, Labrador, but I'll give you a sense of what we're talking about. The Hunt River uh, show and the St. Louis River or Lewis River. Both of those, we were able to capture some really outstanding. And then this past year, I, I went to a place called Big River Camp or Big River Lodge. And we got a lot of, we got a little bit of dry fly, but we got a lot where you're swinging a fly. But, you know, the traditional wet fly we're all familiar with in trout. Yeah. But they put what they call a riffling hitch on it, which makes the, the fly go perpendicular to the current. Yeah, can you, so, can you uh, what, the the riffle hitch, uh, can you talk a little about? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's got, I mean, uh, Lee Wolf used to love using it, but it, it was a Newfoundlander that uh, came up with it way back when. And, so it was um, created for uh, Atlantic salmon before it was for steelhead or anything. Yeah, and, and I, well, quick story before I go into how, it, how you use it. Um, a lot of people don't realize in the Great Lakes, it's absolutely deadly on steelhead. Oh, cool. I was on the Salmon River in Pulaski, yeah. and a guide and I were using it, and we were hooking fish after fish, and everyone was nymphing, and the steelhead were coming up and hitting wet flies, riffled. That's awesome. And nobody would have thought of that. The guide thought of it. I like to say I, I take credit for it, but I didn't. So the riffling hitch is where you're basically, and we've got a video in there, an animation that shows you how to make a riffling hitch, but you're putting basically a couple half hitches on a fly, such that when you cast across the current, it rides, it pulls up to the surface, and it's waking. It's actually waking. So mm. in my mind, I think a salmon sees that, and it looks like a caddis yeah. that's skating on the surface. And is the fly... Is something a, that agitates them. Is it a specific, the pattern uh, type of fly you're using? Well, there's a lot of different wet flies, and... Um, that's a whole topic in itself. I mean, about the season. So if it's early season and low or lower water, you're going to use smaller flies. And I'm talking, we're catching 10 pound, 12 pound, 15 pound like salmon on size 10, size uh, 12. Hey, I, wet I, fly. I, Colin, I know we're, we're definitely all over the place. This is good though. Uh, could you talk about, you know, as far as the seasons too, maybe just as you're going to make sure we cover that to know, you know, maybe when the best time to go up to, to that area is if we're specifically thinking about Newfoundland and then, you know, kind of on that end. Um, okay, so the season for Newfoundland is June to September. Okay. And it, but, and then, and the variation here is there are obviously peaks of the run. So the Humber River will have a different peak than the Gander River on the other side of Newfoundland. That's where it really pays to call a guide do a little research as to where where you are and what, what time of year. Like every river has its heartbeat of when the, the, the what they call the peak of the run is, just like for steelhead, and when the shoulders are. So you're still going to have fish coming in, but there's not going to be the number. And that's it. Really varies from place mm -hmm. to place. Okay. So, but June through I, September, I, it, it. and we're talking a lot of geography here too. Yeah. I mean, just that's to drive area. from Corner Brook to St. Anthony's on the West coast is five hours, uh, five and a half hours of driving. Yeah. You're covering a lot of different rivers, just like dozens of rivers up there, gotcha. small to large, but that's, what's great. I mean, um, there's places around Cornerbrook as an example. I've kind of done a show there 
and we went out and the guy would literally, we weren't getting many fish, weren't moving much. He'd pick up the phone, call somebody he knew and he'd say, yeah, okay, we're going to get, jump in the truck, drive half an hour and go on another river. And we were jumping around between rivers based on the tides, based on the number of fish coming up, everything. That's wow. what's really great. Wow. Wow. Okay. There's a lot of places. So I'll give you an example. When you go to BC and you go to the Skeena River, yeah. you're on the Skeena River. You might run up and down in the boat to different places, but you're on one river. Here, you can jump between rivers. Oh, wow. That's Just what's really, really different. cool. Yeah. Right. It's very different. And now, the big rivers, you do tend to stay on them because there's so much water, and the guides will know where are the bulk of the fish. Are they above the falls? Are they Where are they in relation to wherever the river is? So that's the Humber River, they've, the Humber Falls, which are beautiful. But the salmon will jump above that, and they'll be in different parts of that river. Especially what I like about that is once they get above the falls, they're really easy to catch on a dry fly a lot of the time, uh, like a bomber. Oh, yeah. But... And then you go to the Gander River or the Exploits, and it's a different ball game, based on where they are. Okay, and uh, I'm not trying to make this sound overly complicated, no, but it's like anything. Not it, at it, all. It's kind of like my going to Montana, and early season is very different than going in September when I'm throwing hoppers with the dropper or two hoppers. You know, it, it, they're different. You have to adapt based on the water levels, how long the fish have been in the river, because you know these fish have come in from the ocean. And they generally go back after spawning. So, you know, the, it depends how long they're in the river and, and then where they are in the river. That's right. As to what your techniques are going to be. That's right. But that's yeah. where a guide really helps you to get, you know, conversant with what's the current conditions right away. This episode is sponsored by Deli Fresh Design, a company that makes sustainable fly fishing gear in the heart of Denver, Colorado. Deli Fresh blends old waders and recycled sailcloth with Cordura canvas to make rugged, river-tested gear such as fly wallets, sling packs, and my favorite, beer koozies. I had a great chat with Ross at Deli Fresh as I was blown away by his dedication to fly fishing and conservation. Here's a short clip of how Ross reduces waste with his personal actions and as a responsible company. But as a company, I'm trying to reduce my impact. Uh, by riding a bike or taking uh, the bus or shared uh, shared cars, stuff like that, on uh, for commuting. And then you know, yeah, when I go fishing, I, I'll get in a car, but I, I try to go with other people. And and so I think there's things that as consumers that we can do on a daily basis. My own mentality of doing those things on a daily basis, like driving or riding a bike, uh, and then trying to see what uh, what materials I can use that reduce waste, or what I'm trying to do as a person and as a company. Pretty good stuff, right? Let's support a great company doing business the right way. All of DFD's gear will help you spend more time casting and less time juggling your stuff. To see these great products, go follow them on Instagram where you can see their latest designs. Head over to delifreshdesign.com and use the coupon code WFS20 to get 20% off your next order. That's Deli Fresh Design and the coupon code WFS20. So if you are hitting the river, I guess you're maybe at one of the bigger rivers, you're going to have a spade rod. And what's the typical, just a normal uh, kind of what you, uh, what you might use up here, a 13-foot rod or something like that? And, and what is the line you're using there? Uh, well, first off, uh, it's floating lines only. Yep. So unlike, you know, well, like that's with steelhead law? fishing, you can use pink tips. Yep. Now, I'm, there's going to be people listening to this saying, no, that's not true. You can use a sink tip, but it is very much frowned upon because they just don't want people snagging fish. So it's considered sporting in Newfoundland and Labrador to only use a floating line with a leader. How people can get their fly down if they're worried about that is then they use bigger flies with what they call irons. So partridge hooks makes hook heavy shaft or heavy shank uh, hooks that will get down in the water column. I'm kind of simplifying what yeah. can be very well, And are these specific, also... But, 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 yeah. But, yeah, it's generally floating lines. So on the bigger rivers, I would bring both, uh, like a switch rod or a spay, and I'd also bring a, a nine weight, you know. Um, I, I don't use a switch rod or a spay, and I've gone there lots and just used either a seven for the smaller fish, like that's the six-pounders to 12-pounders, uh, I use a seven. And for the bigger fish or where I've got to make longer casts or deal with wind, I use the nine. Okay. So, and you said you, you don't use a spay rod usually there? 
I don't personally. Uh, yeah. Partially because I really suck at it right now. I'm still learning how That's to right. do it. I'm, I'm learning on a switch rod, and I'm really enjoying it, actually. And believe it or not, I'm doing most of my learning with smallmouth bass on a local river where yeah. I live, uh, swinging them. But I'm getting there, and, it, and if you go to some of the big rivers in Quebec or, uh, you know, like I said, New Brunswick or, or other places, it really is a benefit to be able to do that because you can't reach with a two-handed rod some of those yeah. spots for the yeah, gotcha. sweet spots, unless you've got a boat. So, yeah, it's on my list of this things is... to do, but that's a great thing. I mean, it's just, it's a variation of everything. So you, if somebody were going there the first time and they hadn't talked to anybody, I'd say, yeah, take a seven weight, take a nine weight, and if you've mm-hmm. got a switch or a spade, bring it. Okay. and Put them it, all in the same tube and put them on the plane. And typically, as far as cat, well, I think first, uh, just a on that point of, you know, the fact that, you know, you are the new fly fisher, you know, you have this amazing uh, program and show and, and you're just still learning spay, you know, is it shows you how amazing it is for those people out there that are new to this. I know I have a lot of listeners in my audience that are, that are new to fly fishing and, and the fact that they could hear that from you, I think is pretty cool to realize that, like you said earlier, it's a lifelong learning process so and I, i'm with you too actually i'm a terrible i i i've cat i've used the spade rod many years but i'm not a pro and uh it's still almost it is a little embarrassing to me you know that i'm not the i could cast a line with a single hand and a eight weight you know i feel good about that but my spay game is still you know what i mean it's a little bit like ah eh, i need to get more time in so I, i'm with you but um but yeah, as far as the, uh, well, let's see, where do you think we should go now as far as taking this to that, that person that's heading up there for the first time? Well, I think the thing is about the flies. So there's a lot of different flies you can take. Uh, if there's one fly that I would always have in my fly box, there's two flies for wet flies. One is the uh, blue charm and the other one is the silver tip. They seem to work everywhere. Another one would be the green Highlander, thunder and lightning, and the Casa Boom. Okay. They're all excellent wet flies. In terms of top water, I love bombers and bugs. Um, I really, really like a brown bomber with an orange hackle. Yeah. I don't know why, with a white calf tail yeah. and a white hackle at the front. Uh, wolves will work, uh, but there's something about a brown, medium brown, not dark brown, but a medium brown to tan with an orange hackle. It works everywhere i've fished for atlantic salmon yeah it's natural uh, it's buggy yeah yeah the what, green what, machine is very popular too what's very, the, very um, popular fly what size and, and how sparsely are these things tied well if you go uh obviously there's a lot on youtube in terms of how to tie them um in this like when you're the the wet flies again low water very sparse if it's deeper water and higher water than a little heavier fly, a little bit larger, and a little more dressing. Okay. So bring a little, a little right. bit of both. And yeah. you're using, and, I, and I had um, in a previous episode, Simon Gosworth was on, and and I think he talked about, God, I want to say that he was using like size 16s or something really small. I mean, do you use some of that tiny stuff? Sometimes you have to, yeah. Yeah. By the way, I'm trying to, uh, I know Simon very well, and I'm trying really hard to get him on the show to, uh, we, we, I did a show with him on the Bow River, but I'm now trying to get him to come out there. And it's just so hard. He's, he's such a busy guy yeah. doing so many things. <laughs> he, well, well, Simon well, is really hard and he's yeah. such a hardcore Lennox salmon fisherman. And oh, no, he yeah. wants to go with me to Labrador or Newfoundland, uh, to try the, the fishing there. So yeah. And, and. I also want him because I know he's going to be able to take me and help me learn about spay casting. I know. But anyways, yeah. and by the way, that's actually a good point. We just started this week, as a matter of fact, putting the learn to fly fish um, videos that Rio makes uh, because we yep. moved to now, like when we first started the channel, we were doing uh, two years ago, we were doing two uploads a week. We moved to three. We're now at five. Wow. Five, you have five so, videos per week. You know, I noticed that because I'm on your stream. I've been on your stream for quite a while, and and uh, you guys pop up. Yeah, you pop up more than pretty much most uh, most of anybody else. So five, that, that's a lot. It is a lot of content, now, and we're producing a lot, and this coming year we're going to be doing more. I'll talk about that in a second, but going back, so what we've done is we're making certain days um, 
kind of like a certain focus. So Saturdays are always the premiere of a new show, full length show, which I want to mention for those people out there, one of the really great things that we're going to start as of this season that we're shooting right now, when we make a show for public television, it is 26 minutes and 40, 26 minutes and 46 seconds long. That's what we're required to make it. Right. Uh, and your this shows year, are still publishing on on TV. Yeah, they're still on TV. And, and, yeah. and the We're same just show delivering our latest YouTube. season. Yeah, you can get the same sh- the exact same show on TV. Exactly. On YouTube. Well, well, yes and no. That's what I'm going to tell you is that we one of the things that always used to frustrate me is that we would go someplace, be with a really good guide or good instructor, somebody teaching one of us, whether it's Bill, it's Tom Rosenbauer, it's Mark, whoever's in the show, teaching us something. And we would have to crush down a lot of the information because we didn't have enough time to combine showing the play, showing the fishing, having some fish catching, and all the instruction. So this year, we're moving to, uh, for those full-length shows on Saturdays, if I've got 48 minutes of content, I'm putting up 48 minutes of content. On TV? Not on TV. Oh, yeah, on, on YouTube. YouTube channel. This will be specific to the YouTube channel. Oh, uh, so you're going to So edit. we will not be restricted by a half hour. No. If I've got it, I go to a place and I've got really good content and we can make it compelling and tell a really good story and educate. If it's, uh, where my test was, um, I don't know if you've heard of a guy by the name of uh, Oz or Ozzy. Um, his first name is Wendell. He made a series called The Underwater World of Trout or Discovery of Trout. He asked me to put his videos into our YouTube channel. And I went, oh, Ozzy, they won't work. They're like, some of them are an hour and a half long. Mm -hmm. And he went, well, let's put them up and see. And they were shot in standard definition, underwater. He's got 165,000 views of the one video alone in Hmm. two months. Wow. So I'm wrong. He's right. Yeah. So, yeah, long format. If it's compelling, people will watch it. And that's my goal. I won't put up something just for the sake of making it long. No. I'm just saying we're not going to be restricted on those Saturday premieres by half hour. Gotcha. Starting this fall, you'll start seeing shows that might be 40 minutes, could be 25 minutes, could be an hour and a quarter. They'll be based on the content of what we get there and making sure that we tell a good story. So that'll be Saturdays. Sundays tend to be uh, an educational video, uh, a longer one. We've now arranged with Rio that we're going to start putting up their Learn to Fly Fish uh, videos on every Friday morning at nine o'clock. Uh, we already are working with Orvis and they're helping us. I work with Pete Kutzer and yep. we're doing his casting videos because Pete is just so good at instructing and Rio's going to have some of those too, how but the that, real ones. Are, I, yeah. How does that go work ahead. when you, um, you know, for, I guess these are partnerships. I mean, how does that work when you, um, you know, you build this, is this just a strictly a providing more value for the listeners or is there some sort of a, like a, a monetary business piece here where you're working together? I'm just curious to, you know, because these are, you're, you're some of the biggest, biggest, uh, people and names in fly fishing. I, I'm curious to how that all works. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, both Rio and Orvis are our supporters. Okay. Uh, so obviously there's a direct relationship, but I'm also very open. I'm working with say the Jensen's, Dave and Amelia Jensen, and, uh, we're doing a lot of collaborations, uh, and, and just, I'll put that out there. Anybody listening that has a fly fishing channel, I'm all, one of the things I've learned that works very well on YouTube is collaborations. And I think this is, it, it behooves like my being on your show. And I'd love to have you, Dave, come and join us, me and yeah. go fishing somewhere. For sure. If I can help promote your podcast, why wouldn't I? Because yeah. that's going to help that many more people learn about fly fishing and all the different topics you do. And you're going to tell me by pointing people to my channel. And it, it's such a small community, fly fishing. It is. There, there, there's, there shouldn't be any separation. We should all work together um, at, because this isn't bass fishing. I mean, <laughs> in, in the world of fishing... Bass fishing is 64% of the market. I can give yeah. you the numbers. And fly fishing is, dependent upon the, the region of the United States or Canada, it's 10 to 15% of the market. That's right. So we have to be realistic. It's a smaller number. But at the same time, our small community, we have a lot of people. I mean, what's the latest stats? I think there's a, over a million people a year are trying fly fishing in the United States. So I'm trying to help all those people who are learning, but I'm also trying to help the people who 
have been fly fishing for 10 years or 20 years to teach them about new places, what to bring, what to use, how, you know, all that mm-hmm. stuff. So all these collaborations only make sense because if the Jensen's who go to New Zealand a lot and they do all this great video, some of these Jensen's going to New Zealand, they've got some great content, but they also do a lot of educational things because they get them, they get great video of how to present a dry fly to that trout and how do you make the right cast to do that and not spook the fish? Yeah. So I'm working with the Jensen's. I just saw them in uh, at the Orvis Guide Rendezvous in Missoula, and we shot a little on-camera thing. But we're going to be doing some more work collaboratively, and I'm hoping to do that. I've arranged that with Midcurrent. I've arranged it with uh, Gink and Gasoline, yep. with uh, Lewis. So, I mean, That's I guess what I'm trying answer. to say is, yeah. well, it's just I'm trying to work with everyone who wants to work with me. That's and perfect. I will help them, and, and, and by doing this together, we help everyone, all your listeners, anybody that wants to, to, to fly fish, and especially during the winter when we're all going crazy and we're thinking about the next season, um, it helps you get through the winter. This is the content that they want, your podcast, our videos, whatever it is. And so yeah. that's kind of where, going back to your original question, that's why I'm doing these things. So like Rio has their own YouTube channel, but the thing is YouTube is such a huge yeah, um, portal. Right. It's hard to be found, yep. right? And so I, I suggested it to Simon. He was right away on board with it. He, he said, no, that sounds fantastic. And people say, yeah, you're just trying to help sell their products. If you look at their videos, they have videos that are about a new fly line or a new leader, but they also do a lot of instructional things, like how to properly tie a leader. Mm-hmm. Like I just uh, scheduled one for this Friday, which is all about how to tie droppers to your leader. And in fact, he shows four different types of droppers to be tied, including one I didn't have heard of uh, called the Poland dropper. Hmm. Um, so diff- how, how to do that. Yeah. And I actually like his videos. Or I'll give you another one. Pete Kutzer just did a video about how to go through the woods with your fly rod and keep it together. Oh, there you go. When you're traveling from spot to spot and you say, well, that's easy. If anybody out there knows what I'm talking about, not only are you snagging, but I lost a rod tip once doing oh, that. Yeah. And I could not find that rod tip because I took it and broke it down because I had to walk down the river a while and it was dark and guess what? I lost that rod tip. So he goes through, they seem real simple. Some of them are more advanced, but, you know, or I've got um, uh, Jesse from Orvis doing a whole series about Euro-nymphing or tight line nymphing. Nice. We got George Daniels doing something, which that's actually something else. Uh, Some people out there, and you know about this uh, because you're talking with Tom, Tom Rosenbauer, we did Tom's first season of the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing, or it's also known as the Ultimate Guide to Fly Fishing. It's going to be uh, coming to public television in uh, 2020. But we're right now shooting his second season. Hmm. In fact, as we're speaking right now, Tom is in the Catskills shooting an episode about dry fly and nymphing. That's uh, about for trout. So yeah. that, all, his, all his shows are inside our channel. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I mean, I, like I said, that that's the perfect answer because, you know, I mean, that's, that's the stuff that I've realized too. And I, I've said it a few times that, you know, when new podcasts, fly fishing podcasts come out, I, I don't feel there's any competition. I don't think about that at all. I just think of that. We need more, more podcasts out there because the, that's just more information, more people. And, uh, and it's great. No, I, I love hearing that because that means that there is a potential that I might be able to, <laughs> might be able to connect with you more down the line. I'd love to obviously, you know, kind of reach some more people and, and share my message. The cool thing is the videos is amazing. And everybody says videos is, you know, that's where it's going. Right. But, um, but the podcast is cool because it's audio and they can take it with you, you know, if there's no coverage. And, and so that's a big bonus too. So there might be places where the audio makes more sense you know, or video. And, and this is the cool thing. Cause this show we're doing here is, uh, is going to be a great resource for that person. That's, uh, that's heading up there. Um, so, and, and I can tell you, Colin, just a heads up, we are not going to, um, be able to get, get into everything. So I hope to down the line, get you back on again, because, uh, you know, there's just a ton of information and I, and I've loved hearing about your story here with, um, the new fly fisher. So how do you want to, you know, we're, we're a good chunk in here, uh, over an hour. How do you want to kind of, finish up the you know newfoundland atlantic salmon piece to make sure that we kind of do our best to cover all the you know the resources for that person well if you don't mind dave before i answer that to go back to your podcast what i really like about your podcast whether it's tom rosenbauer it's april Volke, i love downloading 
and I'm driving long distances, uh, sometimes for work, like going to do a TV show somewhere, or I'm sitting in an airport, and what better way than to listen to your podcast with Simon Gosworth or whoever you have on, and you learn so much. Yeah. And they make me laugh, I hear funny stories, but I also learn a lot. Mm -hmm. I learn about places, subjects, uh, topics, and... That's where I think the place of podcasts are. I think they're just so fantastic, and I'm glad you're making what you're, you're making because they're another way for everyone to be engaged and do what they do, but I'm still driving. Yeah. Right? I can't listen to that on the radio. I can't get that on my XM, Sirius XM radio. I have to download that, put it on my phone, and Bluetooth it in, and isn't it so wonderful that I've got that, I'm, like I'm about to do it this Saturday, seven-hour drive there by myself to go join my friend. But guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to listen to podcasts. Nice. I'll be listening to your podcast. Perfect. So that's a great thing. So thank you for doing it. Just like the videos, they have their place. I think they're a valuable tool. And they're kind of like a magazine that you can still drive or sit there at the airport and be on a plane or whatever and still be fly fishing. Exactly. So going to to, to answer the question, um, Newfoundland to me, uh, I'd encourage a lot of people to go there. And it's not... You know, I work with Newfoundland Labrador Tourism, and I'm not doing this as a plug because there's a lot of great places where you can spend your money to go fishing. I just, Newfoundland, first of all, the people there are unbelievable. Um, they're just so friendly. They're, they're different than other parts of Canada, like where I, I come from here in Ontario, and people are nice here in Ontario, but they're very conservative. There. They're so open. They, mm. they remind me of people in Montana, only they tell a lot of dirty jokes. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Newfoundlanders have a real raw sense of humor. They're always uh, joking and, and doing stuff like that. And um, by the way, just a little factoid, Newfoundland in Canada has the lowest divorce rate in the country. Oh, wow. By half. Jeez. They have very strong family yeah. nucleuses, the strongest in the country. And I know in the United States, you have certain states and yep. certain regions that have the same thing where families, everything, Newfoundlanders, that's what it's all about. Wow. And you see that transcend down to the river with the people that take you out on the river. And they just, they're very personable. Um, sometimes we call it Newfoundlandese. They've got a very uh, heavy accent, um, sort of like going up with somebody in Scotland or going to Australia. They have an accent and, and, and you have to ask them, like they don't call it, we would call it a current. They call it a tide, even though it's in a river. Yeah, same thing. Oh, right, uh, a right. set of a set of rocks, you know, which we would call rapids, they would call it a rattle. So that's <laughs> the fun part. You get to discover some new language gotcha. and stuff like that. But the biggest thing is the people there and the fishing and how pristine the waters are and the whole experience there. It's just absolutely wonderful. Right, right, right. right. I so, can't. Yeah. It, it's just a great experience and it's very reasonable cost. Uh, yeah. Labrador is more expensive, and I'm not saying it's not a great place. I love Labrador; absolutely love it. It's, it's even more pristine than Newfoundland, but it's it costs more because of the variation of bringing in uh, planes and getting things in. So it costs more. But then again, you're going to go on a river and never see anybody. Newfoundland, there's a chance you'll see other anglers, but there's not that many anglers. Not compared to you know like other places in the United States or yeah, Canada, no, it's not, uh, or yeah. say or even Alaska. And um, it's just a a very cost-effective way of going and having a great experience. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so, well, let's just take it quickly to, so we talked a little bit about rods. We have, you know, I've got a nine nine foot, nine weight. I got my rod. I got my leader. I'm assuming you're doing pretty, like, what is your tippet? How big are you doing on your, and how, what length is your leader? Okay, good question. Um, first of all, if you're fishing in rivers, uh, Newfoundlanders do not use tapered leaders. Yep. At all. Perfect. They use a straight piece of leader. They typically will use a 9 to 12 foot piece of straight mono, 10 to 12 pound. Perfect. I mean, that, that's, and, and the reason for that is just because what, it it, uh, it sinks a little bit better or, or why, the, why the straight? Um, there's a number of reasons. First of all, they don't like any knots in the, the leaders because that it affects the performance of the fly in the current. Because hmm. they, they cause micro drag. Oh, yeah. uh, the tapered leaders, they don't like because uh, you'll have more break offs with them. Oh. The straight piece of mono, and I won't get into manufacturers, but they just like using a straight piece of mono. Um, yeah. And typically it's 10 or 12 pounds. And, not, and not, not 15 or, or, 
or no. or, or twenty. I mean, because you're talking, you got a forty pounder on there. I mean, those guys maybe are going a little heavier. They can, but no, generally yeah. not. Okay. All right. So, so basically, that's all part of the sport. Yeah. No. And just so you know, like I, I'll go to a place and you know we'll have a good day, and I'll hook into ten or ten fish, of which I'll land three. And They're very much like steelhead on the west coast. You're yeah. going to blow a lot of tires, and I consider myself a reasonably competent angler, but you get a, a river that's got a little bit of flow, and uh, those fish know how to use the current. Gotcha. And it's are you, so much fun. Are and they you, jump. Remember, they're jumping the I whole know, time, that, and they're throwing the flies. That's the amazing thing. So, And are you using the um, the double hook there? No. In fact, I will put in a plug about that. Please don't use double hooks. That's yeah, an old but, traditional but type of fly, yeah. and they do damage to the salmon, and that's when people used to keep salmon. Don't use double hooks. They yeah. look real pretty, the fly, when they tie them, whether it's a green highlander or an alley shrimp on a double hook. Don't use them. They they do damage to the... I, I, I really saw my salmon. You're allowed to keep uh, a small salmon. It depends upon what... You know, every year they change the licensing on the, the, the tags and what you can keep, but I really saw my salmon, and and I don't want to harm them. So I always use a single hook. Gotcha. Okay. So, so that's good. So that's I'm... my personal opinion. And then I know there's some people out there that would say no to that. And I like my double hook flies. And yeah. I can't even remember what the regs are in Newfoundland. No one in New Brunswick, you can use them. You can use them in Quebec, but I, well, why I don't would know you want to, that's the question that comes to me. I mean, fishing for steel, and I know it's a little different species, but I mean, why, why would you want to use double hooks? goes back to what I said. Uh, they, they, that's back in the day when you kept the fish. But I mean, it seems like the, well, yeah, I guess you got two hooks. It's going to, it's going to, just like a treble hook is going to better chance of yep. uh, yeah holding on to the fish. Okay. So it doesn't have anything to do with really the weight of the fly and keeping the fly upright. I well, guess. I think it's, uh, yeah, it does probably weigh more. It, it has a bigger silhouette. It has a number yeah. of things that are a benefit, but the detractions are much larger. So again, going back to the day when people kept the fish, it was a great fly. Yeah. And it was probably easier to tie the pattern onto. Like I know people that use, um, there's a popular fly. It looks like a shrimp. It's called alley shrimp invented by a chap in Scotland. And it's really effective in Nova Scotia on the Marguerite river, but it, a double hook oh, does so much damage. Yeah. I've seen them, what they've done. So, and, we, and you release the fish, but you've, you, you may have, cut its chances of survival by 50%. This is good. I'm, I'm glad, uh, you know, because I do have definitely some listeners across, you know, Europe and stuff. So this will be a, hopefully a good conversation starter again. I'm sure it's been talked about. Okay. So we got, you want something else topical? Can I bring up something oh, yeah. else topical? That yeah. I love people because I get emails about this. Using gloves. People, yeah. uh, this whole thing with the brook trout and the hatchery and, and showing the glove mark and you shouldn't use gloves, keep them wet and all that. You're going to do more damage to these Atlantic salmon by not using a glove. This is my personal opinion, but I've also talked to a lot of biologists. Uh, in fact, I just met with one who's doing a whole study on catch and release and has already done a lot of work, and he said the gloves don't hurt um, the fish. And, and what I'm talking about is that these waters are generally very, very cold, and what we're talking about is fungus. Well, fungus yeah. needs warm water to grow. That's right. And even if you take a little slime off at the tail, the salmon tend to grow it back very quickly, especially in cold water. They don't have the exposure. Wherein, when you don't use that glove and you catch a big fish, you can't get your hand barely around the tail. Yeah. I got a 39-inch fish. This thing was like it's thicker than my forearm Jeez. at the tail. I couldn't get it around. So I needed a glove. I keep it in the water because I don't like lifting them out. Um, but And if you see any photos of me with a fish out of the water, that's years ago. But, yeah. you know, I keep them in the water, lift them up slightly for a photo, but I use a glove just so I can hold it and release it properly yeah, and not have it fall on the rocks or damage itself or anything like that. Gotcha. Same as using nets. We use nets Yeah. Um, for the same reason, just like they do on the West Coast with steelhead. You have the big hoop nets with the good lining and that yep. so you don't do any uh, yep. damage to the fish. But anybody who says anything about the gloves, I'm just putting it out there that, uh, yes, if you're fishing in Connecticut on the Farmington River, I would definitely not use a glove. If you're in Labrador and you're fishing for brook trout and the water is cold all season, yeah. it it is not a factor. And is the thinking it is there not a factor. is the thinking there if you use a glove in the areas, some of the, those other areas that it, it, it rips off their scales and then there's more stuff uh, whatever. Well, it, yeah, and again, that's that that's based on the glove you're using, right? Yeah. 
So if you get the gloves, the black gloves that, you know, like Orva sells and other companies that are, are very, they're like a mesh, like in a, in a fishing net, yep. they don't do the same damage. Because there was a time it was very popular to use the Rapella uh, Kevlar gloves. Oh, yeah, right. And wow. they, they, when a fish struggles, they're, they're so, the yeah. mesh is so uh, broad, but it's tight. I'm not saying that right, but it did do damage. I've seen it where a lot of scales would be mm-hmm. left on the on the glove after you let them go. Or the atypical white cotton gloves you could buy at the gardening center at the dollar store. I think they do some damage. Yeah. The mesh gloves, no. They gotcha. do far less damage. They'll take a they'll definitely take slime off. Even when you wet your hands, wet the glove now, you're gonna take a little slime off. But you know something, if you want a picture of a fish, I don't care where it is, you're gonna take some slime off. Yeah. Even if you wet your hands. You're you're Deluding yourself if you don't think you do, and if if, if that's going to bother you that much, then I also believe that uh, I'm probably getting some people who are listening to this upset. But you you've got to make choices when you fly fish. I mean, catch and release is good. You have to accept the fact there's going to be a mortality no matter what you do, barbs, barbless, small hooks, whatever. But you do your best not to hurt the fish if yeah. you want to release them. Yeah. And the glove thing, it really depends upon where you're fishing. If I'm in the Arctic and I'm catching Arctic char, I'm using a glove. I don't want to hurt those fish because they're strong and they're still flopping when I'm holding them and I get that picture or I'm releasing them at the side of the boat. I'm sorry. It just yep. it really is based upon where you are, what you're doing. I've had people send me emails about Northern Pike and we're using a glove, and they don't realize that Northern Pike are the biggest snot rockets in the world. <laughs> They've got so much slime on them. They don't, it does not. Yeah. We're doing it because we don't want to hurt the fish. you got a 25-pound Northern Pike, and it starts log and it'll fall in the boat we're holding them to, yeah. to preserve them but That's there's huge. so much slime in those fish it doesn't hurt it what? so that one video there's a, 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 an example of a video that did in my p- opinion did actual damage it didn't help huh. it because that was a hatchery warm water not the right conditions those things are known for their uh, fungus growth in fact that's why they're putting stuff in the water all the time and this is the biologist telling me but i also think it has its place too so if you you're fishing in montana and it's a warm day and the waters have, have really got, I mean, because Montana and uh, the American West, just like parts of Canada, thanks to global warming, the water temperatures are going up. And yeah, you maybe shouldn't keep them in the net, keep them wet, and then release them right from the net. Yeah. It's all about where and when. Gotcha. What about Sorry, the... Sorry, uh, that was a rant. I didn't no, mean no. to do that, Dave, but I, just, I get the emails and the feedback about it. Just I want people to know anytime we're doing shows, we our goal is not to hurt fish at all. Yeah. It's not about the show. It's about doing the right thing because we're trying to set the example and I know some people out there would disagree with me, but I'm just telling you, I've done a lot of research on this with biologists. In fact, I'm trying to talk one by the name of John Cook, who, is doing, who just finished doing a whole study in the Bahamas on bonefish and tarpon and catch and release down there uh, for the Tarpon uh, Bonefish Trust. Mm-hmm. Well, he's now doing, he just finished doing, uh, also he just did one on smallmouth bass. I'm trying to get him to come on the show uh, or do a video for uh, our, our our YouTube channel about catch and release gotcha. and proper techniques. Gotcha. Yeah, well, I think it's a big thing. It's a big factor. And as he says to me, uh, and, he, and he did a presentation at a local club, he said, you know, there's no set standard that works everywhere. It all depends huh. where you are, barbless, barb. I mean, there's so many factors involved. That, that's what I was going to say. You said exactly. Time of year. That was the one question I was going to have. And, and on this show, I, I definitely don't get into com- uh, conservation too much just because we usually don't have time. But, you know, on that barb to barbless, are you using barbed or barbless up there? I use both. Yeah. And when, when would you use a, a, a barbed of, if you're up to Newfoundland versus a, a barbless? When I go to the smaller hooks, I tend to use the barb. When oh. I use the larger hooks, I tend to take the barbs off. Gotcha. Yep, and, you- and but that but just so you know, the same biologist I spoke about, he was telling me, well, you realize when you take the barb off on a larger hook, it has deeper penetration, and your chances of killing that fish are higher. Huh? Oh. So, so he's saying his chances of killing are higher going barbless. And I thought, well, I thought it would help it because it would make it easier to release. And and he said, yeah. no, there's the other side of it, and we know from our tests that the barb actually prevents a deeper penetration. It may be tougher to get out, but it goes deeper. And if you hook it in the wrong place, it'll go in and pop an artery, oh, and a, the, you're going to release wow. the fish, but it's going to bleed out later. Look at that! There's and another one. I was like, one. "Wow, I didn't know that." There's another one. I know. That's, that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of yeah. depends. That's that's why actually tube flies with those little snell hooks with no barb are becoming so popular because you can hook a nice brown trout, you can hook a smallmouth bass, you can hook an Atlantic salmon with a tube fly. Yeah. The small hook 
get it up near the edge of the lips That's and right. do far less damage than you will with, you know, a small hook with a barb, but on a traditional, That's right. you know, downturned hook. Right. That's right. It, it, there's so many factors here. I mean, th- that's a whole podcast and I'm not qualified in my opinion to talk about it, yep. but if you ever want to talk to that biologist and you want to get people sending you lots of feedback, I'm sure you'll get it. I got I'm sure you. you're going to get it from no. my little discussion here. This is awesome. But, <laughs> um, well, let me bring that cause we're going to try to wrap this thing up here. But so, so we're back in the river. We've, we've got our, you know, we've got a rod leader. We got our flies. We're, you know, and we got to run, we got a guide. So he's, he's pointing us to the right run. And, and when you sit out there, can you take us to walking up to that run and what it feels like, what it looks like, wh- what the whole thing is into you getting into that fish? I mean, I'm, I'm picturing, are we picturing a typical, is this a pool? Is this a run? What, what do we got going here? If it, it, it really depends um, upon the type of river and size. I'll say that, I mean, this is where it's just like trout fishing. The, there's going to be fish at the head of the pool. You know, where the ripple starts, there's going to be fish at the tail of the pool that might have just moved up and they're resting at the tail of the pool. It could be they're down behind some boulders or they could be in front of the boulders in a hydro cushion because they use that very effectively. I, I just put a video up a few months ago about the hydro cushion showing Atlantic salmon doing that very thing, mm-hmm. sitting in front of a boulder. And the number one comment people are making is, I Top fish were always behind rocks. No, nope. it depends upon how the hydraulics are working underwater. Sometimes it's better for them to sit in front of a rock than it is behind it. So to go to, to answer your question, again, that's where the guide can help you. But if you didn't, like if you were just there by yourself, you know, it, you're going to do your typical thing where you're going to probably start with a dry fly and you're going to break down that pool or that run by making progressively longer casts and typically what the guides will be asking you to do is make two casts at this length with your drift then lengthen by a foot and do it again and you do two more casts then another foot and by that you break down or dissect that run or that pool with your fly if you don't have anything moved to it it might be there's no fish but it could be that you've got the wrong presentation i.e the wrong fly so you switch from a dry fly to a wet fly and you repeat it hmm. and are you working so, your, are you working the run kind of like the steelhead where you're casting and stepping your way down yes you are yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Same. so but yeah. again that's uh, it depends upon how much reach you have with your fly um and you know if you've got other anglers there so oh. i know when i fished on the marguerite river the river etiquette used to be two casts, then two steps down, two casts, two steps down. If you rose a fish, then you could work it. And the guy behind you who is trying to go through the pool understood that and waited. Yeah. But they also used to sit on bench. They have good ri- river etiquette in, on the Marguerite River hmm. in Nova Scotia. And people sit there and chat and compare flies and wait for their turn to go on the run. Newfoundland's a little bit different because um, there's so much water and there's so many fish. It's a, a different ball game but you don't have to necessarily do. But yes, typically that's what you do is you're working your way down through the run by taking steps. But it's that famous 45 degrees across yeah. and swinging a fly through. That's and it. there's actually, in some of the videos I've got in the channel for Atlantic Salmon, we actually have an animation that shows you how to do that and break it down. So you do it. And then Perfect. you know something that same same thing works for brook trout. If there's brook trout in a riffle, I mean, that you should be breaking down the riffle the same way, whether you're mm-hmm. swinging a wet fly or you're uh, using a nymph. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And, and methodical. You, t- you approach it methodically. Yeah. Yeah. Systematically methodically. And, and so, yeah, in, we probably won't hit on everything today, but it sounds like this is the cool thing is that, you know, you have a, a bunch of resources over there and, and folks can go there and search your channel and, and, and watch it on video, you know, take it to the next uh, the step further. Um so do we, do, you know, anything we missed here or anything you want to add just for, again, thinking of that first Atlantic salmon fishing trip, um, any other resources or anything you might note to help that person get their first fish? Uh, first, uh, Newfoundland Labrador Tourism has a very good website for finding places to go and places to stay. And, you know, uh, that's one resource I would tell people. Uh, second thing is that they're... In Newfoundland, uh, the river, they call them scheduled rivers. If they look under Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, they actually have a list and show a map of all the scheduled rivers that have runs of salmon in them. So you can determine based on where you are going in Newfoundland, where those runs are. Oh, cool. 
um, and they'll have the seasons hmm. for that as well posted there. Mm-hmm. Um, the next thing is that there are some good blogs. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, but there are some good blogs. If you do a little searching on the internet, mm-hmm. talking about Atlantic salmon, and there's also some Facebook groups uh, run by Newfoundlanders where you can go in and ask questions. And they are the same people that would probably give you recommendations on good guides in certain areas. Because, you know, back before I started doing the TV show and I was in the military and I would, I remember going to uh, Stephenville and I hired a local guide and he took me out in the local rivers and showed me where to go. And mm-hmm. I think we hit three rivers when I was there. Hmm. So that helps a lot. Cool, cool, yeah. That's, that's... And, and, and if I could say the one thing, anybody who's never tried Atlantic salmon fishing, when you hook a fish, one of those fish, on a seven-weight rod or a nine-weight rod, whether it's six pounds or it's 15, it's like sex for your arm. Yeah. That's the best way I can put it. It's oh, wow. Just, they just jump so much. They're so strong. They they <sighs> they do catapults through the air. Um, I know some people who have a lot of money that can fish for anything they want, and they go all over the place, but the thing they love the most, like Sam. Yeah. It's, it's it's kind of like their cocaine. I mean, they just, they're addicted to it. Sometimes they'll go to the Kola Peninsula for it, which is very expensive and a long way to go and go through a lot of trouble to get there. But you don't need to do that. I mean, yeah. Newfoundland Labrador has got a lot of resources there. and But there's a reason why those people are addicted to it. Um, yeah. Same way people are on the West Coast for steelhead, that, that hit, that tug, that rise to come up and eat your fly or just even bump it. It just, it's so... You got to put a lot of work in sometimes to get that one fish, and another day you're going to be a rock awesome. rock star. You're well, going to you're going to get eight or ten. I mean, it just really depends. You you, uh, you said it well. Called the uh, yeah, the cool thing is that you're in Ontario, right? I live in Ontario. Yes. Yeah, you're, so that's perfect because uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, Jimmy, uh, remixed my fitness. Shout out to Jimmy. Uh, he's up there. We've never met in person. We've actually been kind of uh, you know online sort of. It's kind of been this funny thing, but. But I, you know, we've been joking about. It, but I plan on getting up there. So hopefully, I can make this, uh, you know, sometime maybe connect with you and, and you know, you guys when I make it up there. Because uh, I've had a couple of shows on here. Where we've talked a little bit about Ontario, um, some of the fisheries. But I, you know, I just haven't gone into depth on it. So I'd love to pick your brain more. Hey, I got, you know, I know we're, we're pretty far in this. Do you got a quick, uh, cut, a few more minutes for a little rapid fire round? Sure. Um, I just have a couple of uh, really quick, just zip through a couple of questions here. And the one I always like to hit on is, uh, you know, I call it the 222. It's basically top two flies, top two tips, top two resources. And you've already given us the flies and the resources and I think the tips, but do you have any other just general, um, you know, fly fishing tips that you might provide that would help that person if he's out there trying to swing up a, a Atlantic salmon? Um. Or is it just like steelhead fishing? Pretty much, you just cast it out there, swing, cast, swing, and then you're eventually gonna gonna hit one. Well, uh, no, that you, no, there are little nuances uh, that will make a big difference, and this is my learning from other people. One is that if you ro- if you roll a fish, whether on a wet fly or a dry fly, and that fish comes up and takes a swing at your fly, before you make the next cast. And remember I told you, you're, you're measuring your cast. So when you cast out, you're casting all your line out, mm-hmm. maybe just except for a foot at your reel. And you're putting it through so you know the dis- same distance. A guy taught me, and it's so true, shorten up a foot yep. right after that roll. And the reason why is when that fish comes up, when it goes back down, it's usually moved forward a bit. It's not in the same That's right. position. That's right. So if you cast again, you're probably either going over top of it or behind it. So shorten up a foot. It's amazing My daughter learned that when we were on the big river in Labrador, and it made such a difference for her uh, success rate. That's awesome. That'd be one. Um, Second thing is that uh, when you're using a bomber, sometimes you know where there's some fish line and you're throwing the bomber and you're not getting activity. One of the things that uh, a very uh, hardcore angler taught me is uh, skittle. Like, you know how you skitter a a goddard caddis Mm -hmm. for trout? Do the same thing with the bomber. Skitter it, let it drop back. Skitter it, let it, it really agitates the Atlantic salmon, and they'll come up and they'll at least bump it. But a lot of times hmm. they'll take it. So on skittering and it, before are you they of, wouldn't even look at it. Yeah, by skittering it, you mean you're kind of moving it back and forth, or or up yeah, and down. Yeah. So and down. say so the fish are say 45 degrees from me by a rock. I've cast it. I've let it go by as a dead drift, but then I do it 
an, uh, reach cast up, and then I wiggle the, the fly after that cast up so it goes past them going upriver, and then I let it drop back again over top of them. And then I skitter it back up. I do it multiple times. It agitates the fish because mm-hmm. the fly's in their window, and it's not going away. And gotcha. they finally gotcha. nail it. That's great. I've seen it great. multiple times. It works really well in the right circumstances. Perfect. Okay. And what about uh, just a quick little tip on on video for somebody that, that wants to do better videos for fly fishing or out there? Any a little quick tip on that? But doing it? Well, just taking video. Recording? Yeah, if you're, if you're videoing out there, using your video and you want to pr- produce v- better videos, yeah, if you're taking it, do you have any, any recommendations or tips there? I don't know if there's a, like a, I know I've talked photos wise. I know we've talked a lot about, I had Brian O'Keefe on. He was talking about how, you know, the photo angle is, you know, always, you know, try changing up the angle. So you're not always looking at, at the eye angle. I didn't know if there was some, just some general video tips that you're. No, that, yeah, Brian, I've got a respect for Brian and, and Todd Moan. Um, he, he's absolutely right. Moving around, one of the problems you get, whether you're in a boat or in, you're on shore, is, uh, and, and I always push my cameraman, and, and we try to do things to make it not one-dimensional. Oh, yeah. Now, sometimes oh, that yeah. works. You look at some of the YouTubers that are on there, like John B., that are not fly fishers, but general tackle anglers, and, and some of you guys are just putting a GoPro and strapping it to the chest and, and then using uh, 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 a phone on a stick and they make pretty good content, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. if you're trying to make your, your videos look better, it's all about cutaways. Uh, Discovery Channel, if you want to look at any of their programs, watch anybody that's talking. They never speak more than 10 seconds before they go to a cutaway no of what they're no talking kidding. about. So that was what I was telling you about with my show. You'll rarely see it, maybe my older shows, but my newer shows, there's somebody being interviewed. I don't care if they're in the boat talking. I've got a guy talking to me. We're going to do cutaways to that whatever they're talking about. So always be thinking when somebody's telling you something, if you're trying to make it more informative or relatable, and it's not like nobody likes to look at a talking head for too long, oh. is have think about what they said and then go shoot the things they're talking about. Uh, yeah. Whether it's uh, that fly I just talked about skittering on the surface and getting shots of that to a cast to up above cast, you know, different things. That's the beauty of, you know, drones and all the other mm-hmm. types of uh, gear that's out there. But yeah, doing and uh, underwater shots, get an underwater shot. So I'll get an example. When we were at Big River, we did a whole bunch of GoPro shots uh, of that riffling hitch underwater, which sounds really easy to do, but wasn't trying to follow that fly underwater with the GoPro, but getting that shot. So you get a perspective on what, what the fish are seeing. Yep. Yep. No, so that, that would be awesome. my advice. Yeah. Cutaways, cutaways, cutaways. Because it enhances Perfect. the quality of the content. Perfect. That was a great tip. So what about your most popular, do you have a video out there that, that has, do you know the one that has the most views out there? Yes. We did a, I went down and did a show with Joe Humphreys. Oh, State awesome. College. Joe's a friend of mine. In fact, I was just on the phone with him yesterday. I'm trying to. Uh, coordinate to get him up here uh, to northern Ontario. He wants to go pike fishing with me, of all things. The master of uh, nymphing and mm-hmm. trout. Um, but yes, we did a video with Joe a few years ago, and that video in our channel is the number cool. one video. Cool. Yeah, I had Joe uh, Joe on in a recent episode, and yeah, it was amazing. I, I the first time I really talked to him, and I love that episode because he was. You could just hear it in his voice how how, how good of a person he, he is, you know. And I, I loved. Uh, I love doing that one. So I'll have links, everything we talk about today in the show notes, I'll have links to all these episodes and, and resources and stuff. Um, so what about, we're, we're, we're just about there. I just wanted to, a couple of random ones here that, I, that I've been asking. Do you have, um, as far as music, do you have a favorite band or type of music you like to listen to? Wow. I didn't expect that. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I, I'm a very eclectic music listener. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm all over the map. So it could be the Cowboy Junkies, for oh, anybody cool. who knows that oh, yeah. band. Oh, yeah. I love uh, some of their music, especially the Trinity Sessions. That's my listen to it while I read a good book. Nice. Or at the other end of the spectrum, uh, I love Rush. 
Oh, yeah, Rush. That brings back... And you, know, you can't beat Led Zeppelin either. There Little you go. Days and Confused. There you go. We're going to get along well, that's for sure. I uh, No, I, I've been doing the, this music piece because it's it's my one chance at the show notes. I'll throw in a couple of videos. You know, So I'll have, uh, I'll have to decide whether I'll put some... Oh, really? Out. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. Oh, okay, well, if you want to do it right, then use Sibelius, the, the, the Finnish uh, composer. Oh, okay. I love... When I used to, when I first was learning how to fly fish, I used to take my Sony Walkman. I'm dating myself. Clip yep, it on yeah. my my waiter inside and put on the headphones and listen to absolutely gorgeous uh, music from Sibelius. There you go. Okay. And sit there and swing flies for Atlantic salmon because sometimes you're swinging them up there because there's not a lot of fish in that particular run on the uh, margarita, yeah. but they're yeah. big. But and it, there you are swinging flies, listening to absolutely gorgeous music, and looking at the fall colors. And perfect. it was just a, a moment in time. Perfect, perfect. What is your, um, do you have a quickie, you mentioned some uh, resources, do you have a favorite book, magazine, uh, online, anything that's not your own that you, you kind of follow? I mean, you've mentioned... Oh, yeah, no, there's lots of great resources out there. I, like I said, Todd Moan's channel is is right up there. Um, the, the Jensen's uh, YouTube channel is, is definitely a, a really good one. Um, in terms of books, wow. What would be a good resource? Ask. I got you... tons of books. Yeah, what if you and had the problem one... is there's nobody publishing books. By the no. way, I'm really excited. If I could just say a plug. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, there's a new book about brook trout coming out. And I haven't even got it, but I'm really excited to see it. And it's been written by a guide in Maine. And it's the f- first book since Kara's book about brook trout. I think it's called Square Tail. Okay. And it's going to be coming out soon. So by the time your podcast comes on, it should be published. So I'm really excited about that because uh, there's just not a lot written about brook trout. Yeah. Compared to uh, to brown trout and rainbow trout, not a lot. No, there isn't. There is not. It's great. Uh, Thanks for that one. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Now, what about uh, just for Atlantic salmon? Is there a book, magazine, article, anything that comes to mind that somebody can just go out and take a look at or or get that you don't want to take this the next? Uh, good question. Atlantic Salmon Journal has great articles about not just conservation, but they do uh, a lot about destinations, oh, which I find really great if you want to learn about places to go Atlantic salmon fishing. And that includes Iceland, that can Scotland, Russia, uh, uh, a great new area that people are discovering in Atlantic salmon is Ngaba Bay hmm. in Nunavik, which is northern Quebec. In fact, we're hoping to do a show next year at Wedge Hill, which is uh, a former Caribou Lodge, which is now an Atlantic Salmon and Arctic Char Lodge. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so is a Nookshuk Lodge. All right, perfect. Perfect. And a, and a kind of a, a final one here on, you know, we talked about, you know, 50,000, all, you know, kind of where your channel is going, which is just crazy, uh, you know, how it's growing. You know, for you, what does... Um, you know, what does success look like as far as this whole thing? I mean, it sounds like you're pretty successful now, but I mean, how do you, you know, how do you guide that as you move forward? Well, first, let me start by saying anybody thinks that you get into uh, fly fishing, uh, whether doing what I'm doing, writing books, magazines, running a fly shop, you don't do it for money. No. You do it because you have passion. I could have made a lot more money if I had left the military and become a stockbroker. <laughs> I know I could have. But you do this because you have a passion. So um, that's, I guess the thing is that passion to me is educating people. I love it when somebody comes up to me at a trade show, I'm down at uh, the Edison show or I'm, I'm somewhere and they come up to me and shake my hand and tell me, thanks to you, I'm into fly fishing, I've learned so much. That's cool. Or just getting feedback in our YouTube channel. Tell me, tell us what you like, what you don't like, Send whether it's a private message or you just put it on the, put it out there for people to say. I mean, I'm not talking about the overt criticism, right. uh, but I'm talking about uh, tell us what you don't like. Tell yeah. us what you do like. Who uh, reads all I, the Who reads all the comments? I do. You You read every single one. Every day. Wow. That how many? I take. Many is I, that? It can depend upon the day. It could be ten or fifteen one day, and it could be a couple hundred one day. Wow. It really depends. It. it it's funny how it goes because I'll have the same number of viewers in a week, but the number of comments can vary dramatically. It, it really depends upon oh, the mood. I do, find that in yeah. the winter months of January, February, March, I get more comments than I do in the rest of the year. Do, but I'll, I could actually have more views oh, if people were interested in the content, but less interested in making a comment gotcha. about it. Do you see a lot of 
And YouTube is kind of known for the trolls. Do you see a lot of trolls out there in fly fishing? I, people say there is. Uh, I, I think there's a few, but there's not really that many. Yeah, that, that, that's I mean, the funny thing. Yeah. yeah, haters will hate. I mean, there's always people who are just got nothing good to say, and we get that all. I mean, anybody who works in retail knows that. Uh, yeah. you just, there's some people just aren't happy. But that being said, there is genuine criticism, or there's genu- I, I really enjoy when people give us a, hey, could you do something about whitefish? Okay, let's do something about whitefish. So I, I put it on the bucket list of things to try and do. Could you do more about dry fly presentations for right. the species? All right. Now, you know, what what are the things that you would like us to do to help you, but also help others? That's awesome. And and how do you? Because I struggle with that as well. I've got a a bucket list or a list. You know, I mean, you're not going to be able to get to it all, right? Or or do you have plans on getting to every single one? <laughs> we always plan to try and do it all. We never can. No. So how kinda, do you prioritize? Kind of like, the, kinda like my wife's honey do list on the weekend. <laughs> That's right. How do you, so with, with that, knowing that, I mean, I, cause I realize it, if I do a weekly show, uh, you know, if I did one for the rest of my life, I still wouldn't get to all the people I want to interview. So, you know, how do you prioritize your, your stuff or how do you decide what you're going to do your stuff on? Obviously I've got a biases that help influence what I decide. And my partner, Mark Melnick, has his. Uh, it's, it's striking a balance. Yeah. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, fly fishing is very trout-centric, but there's a lot of expansion into fly fishing for northern pike and muskie. Uh, you've obviously probably had some of those people on your podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of people like bass fishing. So we're doing more shows about that. In fact, uh, we're trying to schedule right now a show about largemouth bass and using topwater and subsurface flies for that. So I'm always trying to explore new things, as long as they're not really bizarre. You know, like yeah. I've got a request right now from somebody to come and shoot a show, swinging flies for catfish. Oh, <laughs> awesome. And I know you laugh, but they do that on the Red River in Manitoba. That's, I'll bet, I'll bet. That uh, sounds cool, actually. And, and it do, well, part of me is intrigued because they're for channel cats, mm. and they're using so they're two-handed big. rods. They're big. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. That, that, that. I just, I, I, it's just such a bizarre thing. So am I racing out to do it? Not yet. Yep. Will we do it? We might just cause it's kind of unique and, yeah. and sometimes that stuff. So a good example of that we just put up in uh, the YouTube channel, we did a show with Jamie Pastelli uh, on the Ottawa river fly fishing for gar pike. Oh, wow. Those big TT yep. prehistoric Arr. fish. And that's, that's an example. Or I've done shows about carp fishing, which I get a lot of requests for, actually. That's yeah. a very popular species. We've done them down in Wyoming, uh, around Alcova and the reservoir there. We've done them here in Ontario. And I've got a request to go to upstate New York and do one. So, again, a very cool species. Not a lot of people are interested in it, but they are the bonefish of freshwater. That's and right. they're not that easy to catch. And you hook one on a seven-weight rod and you're hanging on. That's right. Very cool species. That's right. That's right. All right, Colin, well, I'm going to let you go. We've been, we've been pushed off, uh, you know, the next six to 12 months, anything new you got coming up, you can let us know with either, you know, yourself or the show or anything. Um, I, I think the big thing is that we're going to try and move the YouTube channel. Uh, we're doing a lot more. There's going to be a lot more changes to the YouTube channel to accommodate where we're seeing what people want. And we're going to be changing the playlists. We're going to be changing how things are done. All done to make sure that we're addressing everyone's, what they want, what mm-hmm. they want to see. Very much like I told you, we're going to change how the shows are restricted by the 23, 26 minute limit. Right. We're going to make, we're going to make them on YouTube a whole bunch of different lengths. But we're still going to make content focused ones. So uh, I get a lot of requests about learning more about insects. You know, that's right. Learning more about mayflies, learning more mm-hmm. about how do I determine what insects are on my local river, that type yep. of thing. And then the one that's, by the way, the most popular that we're getting requests, small stream fishing. Huh. That I didn't realize how huge, and I, I, that's kind of where I got started when I got into fly fishing, but I did not realize how many people absolutely love it from yeah. Georgia yep. all the way out west and throughout where I live here. I mean, a lot of people, you know, using a two, three weight rod and yep. going into those little streams and, 
and catching those little crown jewels, whether it's a brook trout or it's a rainbow trout, but catching them. And it, I, that, I think one of the allures, first of all, you have to use stealth. You have to think about what you're doing, but it's also your, it's kind of like being a little kid again. And you're exploring that little creek. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's different every time. And there's the birds the you know, the wildlife's all around you. You're kind of, you're in nature's garden and it's just, I think it's a very spiritual thing for some people. That's why they like small stream fishing. Joe Humphreys loves small stream fishing. That's right. Yeah, uh-huh. Joe. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, good stuff. So if people want to find you, if they have questions, the, um, the new flyfisher.com is the best place. Yeah, or just if you go to YouTube, uh, our website has got a lot of the resources, but um, our website is part of it, but I really would tell people, go to YouTube. Just put in okay. the new fly fisher in YouTube, and you'll definitely get our videos because they're popping up everywhere. And, and then just start exploring our playlists and, and poking around, or just use the search to find what, you wanna, what type of videos you want to see. Great. All and right. then give us suggestions. I really encourage people. Like you say, Dave, Yeah. anybody out there, Tell us what you want. Yeah, and in the comments, just leave a comment. Is that the best play to, uh, place to this? Yeah. Yeah, give you feedback. Or message us, because we, we check our messages every day, too. Okay, good. All right, Colin. Well, uh, that's it. We've definitely pushed this one. I uh, you know, I knew from the start it was going to be hard to get everything in, and I, I didn't get everything in, but uh, we, we did a good job, and it was a fun conversation. I appreciate you for uh, you know the resource you've created. You know, Obviously, 20 years or whatever you're going on now is, is kind of crazy. It's a lot of time, and... And um, I'll, I'll be I'll be hanging with you and, and watching you. So I uh, just want to thank you again. Thank you, Dave, and thank you for what you do. Because as I said, your resource is just as valuable because you're helping a lot of people keep connected to fly fishing, no matter where they are. Yeah, you, you got it. All right, we'll talk to you soon. All right, take All care, right, Dave. See ya. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com/slash Colin. That's C O L I N. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to find out how to support local companies, this podcast, and your journey at one convenient location. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to maybe see you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.